uh, who's watching on Twitter, Facebook, Labourlist, uh, wherever else we might be streaming this right now. Um, John was just telling me uh, that some of his team are off self-isolating or shielding at the moment. All You're of them at the moment, but good evening. Everyone. It's really, really good to join you, Sienna, and everyone else. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm glad. I, I was going to say, I don't know whether we've spoken since... I don't know whether you remember this, but I tried to work for you a few years ago. I made an absolutely, I was just, I was awful. I was so nervous and the interview was absolute rubbish and I don't blame you for not hiring me at all. But I was wondering whether you remembered me from that. I do indeed. You had a narrow escape and, and have gone on to far, far better and more important things than working for me. Um, <laughs> not but no, I remember it well, Sienna, and I uh, was very pleased when you landed the Labour List job. And to see how you've taken it from strength to strength. I mean, for us in the la labour movement, you know, labour list is required following and required reading. So, um, thank you so much. Great job you're doing. <laughs> thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so obviously, I mean, just to remind everyone, we're doing these in conversation events, and they're just they're just sort of in informal conversations rather than grilling, and they're and they're really about introducing people in their new shadow cabinet roles to labour list readers and labour list labour members and supporters who are interested in just what kind of approach they're going to take to the brief. So I'm going to ask John about really about defence because he has now moved to that brief. So I mean, you've been a government minister, you've been a shadow minister, and. I was having a look at all the different roles you've held over the years and you've been in the treasury, education, obviously housing, local government, uh, health. You've been so many, but not defense until now. Did you express a particular interest in defense to Keir Starmer before, before he appointed you to the role? No, um, and quite honestly, our system is a, is, is a bit um, hit and miss. I mean, in, in none of the jobs I've done in the government, uh, or in opposition, in the shadow cabinet, or at cabinet, have I uh, asked for them? Um, with this, uh, Keir rang me up, um, said, "Look, I want you to stay in the shadow cabinet because I'd served throughout Jeremy's period as leader, um, and I want you to do defence. We need to develop a, an authoritative Labour voice on defence again. Um, um, so do it." <laughs> well, I was going to say, obviously, it's clear that already your brief is a particularly important one under Keir's leadership. Why do you think that is? And I was wondering, what were your experiences? I think I, I heard you in an event a few months ago talking about this door knocking on um, the doors of people who were either armed forces or their families and the kind of reception that Labour candidates were getting on those doorsteps. Um, because quite simply, defence and security may not win Labour an election, but it can be a big factor in us losing another election. Um, we have, on defence and security, an even greater deficit with the Conservatives than we do on the economy. Uh, people trust, trust us less to defend the country than they do even to run the economy um, and sound public finances. So these are really deep deficits, if you like, damage to our standing in the public mind, which aren't attached to particular policies, but are something that we must tackle um, and a gap we must close uh, in order to put ourselves in the position by the time of the next election to seriously compete to win government and to win over the confidence and support of many people who have turned against us um, for nearly two decades. What kind of things were you hearing on the doorstep about defence, the kind of things that you will be thinking about now in this role? Oh, well, a, any of anyone watching, uh, anyone who reads Labour List that knocked on doors in that December election will know that the toughest doors to knock were those with Help for Heroes or British Leaves and stickers in the windows. Um, it was, in most cases, not even possible to ask the question, let alone get a hearing. Um, Labour was so far ruled out uh, in people's minds. Um, we went into the election with a 24-point gap with the Tories on defence and security. Um, and for those that see, think that somehow uh, a change of leader changes our fortunes automatically, 
and Kia would be the very last person to say this, it's a necessary but by far from sufficient um, part of what we have to do to rebuild. Um, despite the change of leadership, we're still 21 points behind the Tories on defence and security. So that's, a, if you like, a pointer to the damage that we have to repair, the trust we've got to rebuild. And in many ways, uh, you know, those who are serving our forces, their families and armed forces communities should be part of the natural base and support for Labour. Many come from the same working class communities that um, our traditional Labour movement figures and members come from, that our Labour Party members come from, but they've moved away from us over the last couple of decades um, and, and decisively so uh, in 2019. Yeah, I wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit more because under Jeremy Corbyn, I remember covering this, Labour released these five pledges to support the forces. So it was talking about pay, housing, more representation, like creating a, a body like the Police Federation, um, talking about ending privatisation privatization, and also support for forces children. But clearly it wasn't very convincing to many armed forces personnel and their families who, who were voters and rejected Labour. In what way do you think Labour's approach now will be different to the approach taken then, because it seemed as if on paper there was a good policy offer there. Why will it be more successful now? Is it more of a question of tone than policy? I mean, is it a question of Keir Starmer not being being leader rather than Jeremy Corbyn? Obviously, that will play some kind of role, as you mentioned. Well, I think you put your finger on a, a bigger, bigger problem, Sienna. If, if people have stopped trusting you as a politician, trusting you as a political party, they've stopped even listening to you. No, good, no, no matter how good your policy plans are, if they aren't listening and they're not convinced, then the detail of the, your policy content um, doesn't reach first base. So simply won't cut it. And so this is why um, in general terms, Kira said, oh, okay, we are at the start of a long haul of a likely long parliament. The first thing we have to do is to listen. We have to listen in particular to those who were not with us at the last election. Uh, and I'm mirroring that uh, with the armed forces and armed forces families. He says, we've got to rebuild a relationship, win back a hearing before we can win back any sort of uh, confidence and then support potentially by the time of the next election. This is why he always, Keir Starmer always talks about this as a four year project. And despite really good recent opinion polls at a national level, where he is clearly ahead in the public's mind about uh, against Boris Johnson for who would make the best prime minister, where Labour has edged ahead and has certainly been level pegging for a while with the Tories, that is only step one. And as I said earlier, Keir would be the first to say that is only step one. And certainly I'm very conscious of that as our Shadow Defence Secretary, because we have so much work to do to win back any sort of hearing and confidence and then support amongst armed forces and veterans and the families. I was really interested in how you just said that um, that, that kind of relationship broke down over two decades, something like that. It wasn't just something that emerged under Corbyn's leadership. Why do you think that is? I think we missed some important, two, two, two um, fundamental shifts. It started while we were still in government. Um, I remember at Cabinet when um, we were still in government uh, for the first time talking about Britain's real middle, Britain's real squeezed middle. Not those uh, on social security, but those on ordinary incomes, average incomes, which at that time was 21 and a half thousand pounds, and the 14 million people, uh, either side of that, between about 14,000 and 30,000 pounds a year. These were not people that are in the mind of policymakers in the Westminster World Policy Debate or the media. Um, those were the people who increasingly were working harder, sometimes for two jobs, uh, increasingly dependent on um, support from their wider family, finding it harder and harder to make ends meet. And that, of course, after 2010, with deep public service cuts, a, uh, a 
fiscal strategy in government that drove the economy to the brink of a second recession. Um, and over the last decade, that squeeze has got worse. So there was, that, first of all, there's that as the, if you like, the working, working people have moved, have sent, have felt, can you still hear me with the division bell going on? I, I can, but just, just just to let everyone know there are votes going on at the moment. That's why it, there, there might be those bells heard. So to let those who are with us know, I've um, been given special permission to stay with you rather than go off and vote. So um, I'm very pleased about that. Thank you. Um, so um, it's, it's now been better understood and better documented that sense that the working class um, uh, vote, particularly outside the cities, has moved for a while uh, away from Labour. The second thing is I, I think we failed to pick up some of the sort of cultural and social um, sense of alienation that many communities outside the um, who, who didn't share the priority interests of in what they saw as the political classes and the political debate. And I think that combination has uh, clearly was tapped very effectively by Nigel Farage um, and found its full expression uh, when we had the Brexit referendum that was much more than simply a judgment on whether or not we should be in or out of the European Union and more a general judgment uh, against Brussels, against Westminster, against Westminster, against the interests that seem to have been doing very well in contrast to how very many people felt about them, uh, their families and sometimes their towns as well. I know that it kind of that sort of touches on the cultural values gap mission that I think Keir Starmer's leadership was really keen on addressing. Um, but also it kind of touches on, especially your mention of Brexit, sometimes it seems as if Labour membership is at odds with uh, Labour voters or potential Labour voters. Um, and I was also wondering what you thought of Keir's uh, leadership election pledges. So he had a, a section on defence policy and he talks about no more illegal wars and we presume that's that's reference to Iraq, don't know. Um, and also because of, obviously he had uh, strong opinions about that at the time and also introducing a military intervention act and that actually did a, attract a little bit of criticism or, or skepticism from some people in the party who were wary about what exactly that meant. What did you think of those pledges? And is Labour still committed to those? What, what was your interpretation of what they meant? Uh, for me, they captured a, a, a fundamental principle, which is that um, government needs to be able to take Parliament and the public with it if it wants to commit uh, British troops to major conflict. Um, and it can't simply be done as quasi-constitutionally a government is able without reference to parliament and reference to the public. So Keir quite rightly wants to establish and enshrine that sort of principle. And that was, I think, behind the sort of arguments he made um, in, in, his leadership, in his leadership campaign. Um, what, I've, what I've done um, since Keir has become leader and he's given me this job and he's um, essentially directed the party and demonstrated with his own sort of personal um, leadership and activity about um, wanting to throw Labour open, listen, listen again to those voices perhaps that we've uh, overlooked or have felt we've overlooked them in the past. So I've relaunched Labour Friends of the Forces. We've already had over 400 people uh, join that since we've uh, relaunched that. We started a series of uh, open online public meetings in every region and nation of the country. And we are um, set to launch a call for evidence about the way that this country um, fails its veterans uh, with an ambition that we become, um, under Labour, the, the best country to be um, serving in the forces and a veteran who has served in the forces. I don't know whether you saw, but when I reported on uh, that relaunching of Labour Friends of the Armed Forces and um, 
I published comment piece and I think I did a news story that day and it was on a Saturday, which is usually our quietest day on Labour List. And I don't know if you saw, but it, it totally blew up on Twitter. It was tons of Labour List readers and Labour members, you know, quote tweeting and being quite angry about the fact that the, the, the group had been relaunched. What's your interpretation of that kind of reaction? Do you feel that there's something that Labour members are misinterpreting about that policy initiative, about the group relaunching? What was your kind of response to I that? don't necessarily have an interpretation, I have an answer. Uh, and that is, um, for those of us in the Labour Party that want to see a Labour government, we cannot go into the next election with nearly half the population believing that ours is a party that won't um, keep the country safe and won't protect people from terrorism and other threats. We simply can't do that because we will never win people to us. Um, I said at the very start, defence and security has always been a difficult uh, territory for Labour. Um, it is not, it's, not, uh, it's not a brief and it's not a policies that will win us the next election, but it will play a big part in whether we can win the next election. And, you know, we've, we've got a proud tradition as a Labour Party. We've had some of our leading figures from, um, from Attlee to Ben have served in the armed forces. We've got good Labour MPs like Dan Jarvis that have served. We've got good Labour councillors across the country that have served in our forces. We should be proud of that uh, inheritance. We should be proud of those connections. And I want to see the views and voices of those who've served, their families and uh, forces communities play a bigger part and heard more clearly within the Labour Party, just as I do for those people who work in the defence and high-tech aerospace industries, which are an essential part of some of our important trade unions, essential part of our labour movement, and in parts of the country outside the big cities, which have been labour in the past and are now in Tory hands. On this mission to kind of convince people that the, the left and that the Labour Party specifically can be trusted on security and defence and these kind of issues, I. I was thinking about this um, fascinating article I read in The Atlantic a few months ago about Trump. And it was about, I don't know wh whether you read it, but it was all about how Trump believes that Americans who died in war were suckers in his words and, and how he canceled this visit to a cemetery and apparently said it's filled with losers. Mm -hmm. And you know, Yeah, and he said about John McCain, you know, I like people who weren't captured. And and terrible things like that. And, and he's got this sort of blatant rejection of kind of basic patriotic feeling that didn't really tarnish his reputation for being a champion of America. And it, it would never talk to, it would never occur to anybody in the Labour Party, no matter you know which faction they belong to, to talk like that about the armed forces. And nevertheless, the left is always cast as unpatriotic. What What do you think about that kind of, that challenge that the left has and the kind of double standards in, you know, the challenge of people accepting that you're a patriotic party, a patriotic politician. I think it, it, it starts to point to the challenge we have as a sort of centre-left progressive party um, to find a way of expressing the pride we feel in our country that patriotism without be, that being pigeonholed and seen as somehow right-wing or reactionary. Um, the first duty of any government, including any Labour government, has got to, keep, to safeguard the country. Um, that's surely not a point of contention. And to be um, a force for good in the world. We've done it before uh, in the best of our times. We did it after the Second World War. We were fundamental in helping to set up NATO. Uh, we were fundamental in building the uh, framework of Geneva Conventions and international law to govern conflict in the future that had stood the test of time. Um, we did it when we were in government as well, in parts. We played a big part in the um, multilateral de-escalation and, and reduction of um, nuclear armaments. We cut our own uh, arsenals, nuclear arsenals, while we're in government, by half what had been planned before. And at the same time, we did well by um, those serving in the forces. By 2010, 
those final years of the Labour government saw, quite rightly, pay increases for those serving in the forces, particularly those in the ranks, um, amongst the highest of any of the public sector groups. Um, and for the first time, we started to put in place the what then became a, uh, a covenant that meant our agencies and our local councils gave greater attention to the particular problems that many veterans face after their service. Now, you know, we can build on that. And particularly post-Brexit, post-COVID, Britain has got to be able to define a fresh place in the world. And part of that is as a force for good. And our forces are there first and foremost to do the job that we place on them that none of us would want to do, which is to fight where necessary, protect our country. But we've seen it as well. They've played a great part overseas in helping with some of the um, the flooding and the earthquake relief. They play a big part in some of the UN missions, peacekeeping missions in parts of the world. And we've seen it in our own country here. We saw it before Christmas in the uh, West Yorkshire floods. And we've seen it, of course, with the pandemic when our troops have been building hospitals, distributing PPE, uh, helping run testing and behind the scenes planning with a whole range of agencies from councils to the, uh, to the NHS and, and Public Health England. So they're part and parcel of our resilience as a country. And I would say to uh, centre-left colleagues as well, they're part and parcel of our character of the country. You know, those, those characters and values of service, um, of sacrifice, of discipline, are many of the characters that as, that as British people, we admire and respect most and we value most. I wanted to ask you about um, coronavirus and how it relates to your brief because I, I watched your urgent question today and you were talking about how you and Joe Anderson, uh, the Liverpool mayor, seemed pleased about the involvement of the armed forces in setting up COVID centres, rolling out testing, especially in Liverpool. Um, but you were concerned about whether that was scalable and whether that was having any impact on their duties. Were you reassured by the minister's response today? What do you what do you think about that more generally? No, no, I wasn't. Um, first off, I think the, the public are willing to see the armed forces play a greater role in helping the country through. Um, I take the same view, um, but they want to know what the plan is. They have a right to know uh, how the forces are being used, um, which we don't get at the moment. They have a right to, to have ministers reporting regularly on what the armed forces are doing. And I think that would help more generally with a better understanding and support for uh, forces personnel. In Liverpool, we've got a great example. I mean, Joe Anderson as the mayor there talks very powerfully about Many of the men and many of the young men and women that left Liverpool to join the forces are back there amongst their own families and communities, now doing the testing and helping out their home city. Um, and he's clear, and I think we're all clear, without 2,000 troops deployed to Liverpool, there's no way that they could aim to have citywide testing in particular for those who are asymptomatic but maybe infectious, because this is a pilot to see if we can pick up those. Um, those people at the moment that are under the radar, clearly identify them, persuade them to isolate, stop them from infecting others. And, you know, it, it, I think it points to, aside from a vaccine, what the government has, one of the areas the government's failed most. I, they've talked for months about regular routine testing of NHS staff. I remember back in June, they even, Hancock even started promising as he should have done, care line, care, frontline care home workers with regular routine testing. And this is the way that we pick up the risk of infection in the in, um, uh, quickest, and we help we help stop the stop the spread. So it's potentially an essential part of our program in this country to try and get on top of and stay on top of the virus in a way that the government's failed to do and has lost control again now, which is why we're faced in England with a a new national lockdown. Yeah, I thought it was interesting what you're saying there about people not really being aware of their involvement and what they do, because I think it reminded me when I was listening to your question and reading about it, 
of, you know, the FBU has been shouting about how firefighters have been helping during the pandemic and talking about how they've been distributing PPE and driving ambulances mm. and all those things. And they they kind of, they make it clear and they make it public what's, what's going on behind the scenes that you might necessarily not know about, which, you know, it sort of makes clear that there needs to be some kind of representative body as suggested by Labour. Yes, indeed. Um, I think I, I thought that was a good policy that we went to the 19, 2019 election with. Uh, look at um, the scope for something like the Police Federation for those serving in the forces. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the particular problems that often ser servicemen and women face is that it's very hard for them to have any sort of voice and often information outside the chain of command. And of course, there's an inbuilt discipline about uh, speaking out themselves. So in those circumstances, having um, someone else to speak for them um, directly for their interests just strikes me as a good thing. But in terms of the public understanding um, uh, and appreciation of the role the forces play, in some ways, I just I, 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 I'm critical of the defence secretary during that first uh, national lockdown. At no point during the, those months did he appear at the dispatch box or appear at the number 10 press conference podium to explain what the forces were doing and the contribution they were making to uh, help us get through this mm. uh, i think that was a real missed opportunity uh, and i think he let the forces down for failing to do that yeah that's definitely notable i know that there was well, there's the integrated review. Are you disappointed in how that's been delayed or are you quite understanding about all of that due to the, the COVID circumstances? No, we, I, I think this is, a, this, is the, this is the Treasury cutting the ground from out underneath the uh, Defence Secretary and uh, the Armed Forces. Um, faced with an unprecedented um, uh, escalation of technology, greater complexity, um, fresh threats um, uh, and and adversaries. Um, now more than ever, we need a proper strategic and uh, defence and security review. At a time when Britain is now left the European Union, um, with the experience of the pandemic, um, we needed that. We needed that reset. We needed that fresh direction and definition of how Britain can play its part as a force for good in the world and what's needed on the defence front. Um, and we needed the multi-year uh, funding to back it up. No, no, no organisation, no company would have a corporate strategy without a budget to back it up. Um, and it looks like the um, defence ministry of defence has been left in that position. So uh, I think this is government... Um, sidestepping important decisions that need to be taken at this time. Uh, and my fear, of course, is that just in, as with the two previous Conservative spending reviews, they've simply been a cover for cuts. Um, so we've seen the armed forces now almost 12,000 short of what was pledged in 2015 as the strength necessary. We've seen contracts for essential equipment um, put off costs escalate, delays increase, uh, and we've seen uh, gaps in the sort of capability to defend our country because of those failings. So we had a period without any um, aircraft capable of doing submarine hunting and maritime reconnaissance. Now for a, an island nation like ours in the Northern Hemisphere, um, Close to, close to the high Arctic and uh, within easy reach of Russia, um, that's a dereliction of uh, the duty of government. It's kind of come back, comes back to uh, often how the right can uh, get away with things that the left can't on these sort of issues, doesn't it? But it's it does indeed, Sienna. And we, we talked earlier on about, the, in, in, in a sense, the comparability between the big challenge we face on um, trust on the economy and um, um, running government finances in the same way as we do on defence and security. It's, it's that 
um, conventional conservative credibility that seems hardwired into our psyche and our politics that we have to be able to challenge. We have to be able to both undermine their the confidence that they're getting it right and they're doing the right things, particularly for, um, if you like, the many rather than the few, uh, which I think is an important labor concept and value. Um, so they're not, we've got to both, both uh, expose their failings and we've got to give people confidence that actually labor is capable of doing the job. And on top of that, we then build the policies and the plans that are going to make people feel Labour's not just capable of doing the job. If we give Labour a chance, they'll do a good job. I was wondering what you thought about um, the US election. I mean, obviously, we're all pleased with the result. But um, Vince Cable wrote this, has written this piece. I don't know if you saw it, but setting out quite a counterintuitive argument. He's talked, he said that it might be against his instincts, as in Vince Cable's uh, and Joe Biden's, but without Congress support, Biden actually might end up spending a lot of money on the military because that might be more a more viable way of getting to, to full employment, to boosting employment than, for instance, a Green New Deal when he doesn't have the Senate, uh, the, when he doesn't have Congress on his side. Um, what, what do you think about that? And do you think, how do you think Joe Biden becoming president is going to affect uh, US and, and UK defense policy? Well, look, uh, clearly the two, uh, rerun elections for the Senate seats in Georgia will be um, pivotal to the scope that as a new president, Joe Biden will have. Um, I'm not as pessimistic as uh, Vince, Vince Cable by any means. I think the upsides are um, very significant um, for, for America, but for the world and for Britain as well. Uh, first and foremost, um, Joe Biden's an internationalist. So we will see him um, take the US back into the Paris climate change um, agreement and arrangement. We will see him put in place a route for um, child migrants to gain citizenship in uh, the US. We will see him end the ban on Muslims. Uh, and we will see him, and most significantly for us, I think, um, reinforce the US commitment to NATO, to the alliance, and to the uh, cooperative mutual security that we have in Western Europe. And then I, I, I also believe that um, he is likely to uh, be more interested in some of the really critical um, uh, multilateral treaties that help to govern some of the proliferation of some of our worst in our nuclear nuclear weapons. This kind of leads on to, I mean, the future of defense, because I think Joe Biden spoke during his campaign about um, kind of wiser spending, more targeted spending that is actually recognizing how, you know, how defense is going to develop in the future. And um, I know that Gen General Sir Nick Carter was talking, I think it was last weekend, about, I think he said something like 30,000 robot soldiers could be part of the British Army in the 2030s. And there is this concern about robot warfare, although current policy is that only humans can, uh, would be able to fire weapons. But obviously we've already got remotely operated weapons and that changes things because it makes you more remote, doesn't it, from from casualties and it arguably generates more casualties because it's kind of several steps removed. What's your view of those kind of developments? Are you worried about them? Or are you quite positive? Is there anything positive to take out of those sort of technological developments? Well, certainly as far as Britain's concerned, the level of training that goes into uh, any of the troops operating those remote, uh, those remote weaponry uh, is very high indeed. And actually it's likely to lead to um, probably to fewer casualties and better targeting necessarily than um, uh, more conventional forms of weaponry. Uh, but th there's no doubt about it. They add a degree and a level of new, um, new lethal level in, in the hands of um, uh, other countries. We simply don't yet have an architecture of international law 
or proper military um, convention to deal with some of the, if you like, the new domains of, of warfare, but that's cyber or space. And we don't yet have what we need in place either to deal with some of the high-tech uh, weaponry. I can certainly see over the next decade a much greater in, in, um, use of artificial intelligence, of robotics. But I also believe that at the heart, it's our personnel that will remain the essential and indispensable element of our armed forces. And I think in some ways, you know, both uh, at one level, the example of 2000 troops on the streets in Liverpool underlines that case, just mm -hmm. as the small forces special um, boat squadron personnel that retook the, um, the, the merchant Navy ship in the mm -hmm. channel. You know, high tech, high tech uh, weaponry, high tech systems are essential in the future, but highly trained troops and personnel, I think, are indispensable. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I was also reading about how uh, General Sir Patrick Sanders recently was talking about cyber conflict and he was talking about how there's kind of, there's no longer that same binary distinction between war and peace anymore, which I thought was an interesting comment. Do you agree with that? And how does a Labour government plan to engage with that kind of new situation? I do agree with that. It's why the integrated review is so essential, um, so that we can see what the government's assessment of that is, what their, their response and their strategy for dealing with that is. It allows the rest of us then to find our range on that and say, well, actually, um, different things may need to be done. Um, different priorities may be required, um, but that we need that we need that review. We do need it now, and in part, it's that much of the um, hostility and the threats that we're facing are, are continuous now, rather than in uh, and they're and they're invisible. So for most of us, we don't see the conflict, the aggression, the threats in practice that our defense and security systems are repelling um, and protecting us from all continuous basis in the same way, way as we did with the very obvious, more traditional forms of uh, conflict in territories that are clearly identifiable. Are you having to read up on all the, the kind of the cyber conflict stuff? Because I assume most people, I mean, have no idea of the details of that. Is there anything you've learned in the brief so far about those kind of things? I'm having to read a lot. I am having to learn a lot. I have to say it's much harder to pick up a new brief like this when you can't meet anyone or go anywhere. Um, so the pandemic has been a problem in that respect. Um, but I'm also conscious that, you know, my, my, my job is as a member of Labour's shadow cabinet, it's as a politician who's got to be concerned about public sentiment and public com communications as well as policy. Um, and my job isn't to become a, a technical expert or not only to become uh, technically well-informed. We've got plenty of technical experts, um, but if I am the shadow defense team and I've got some great people who work with me with Stephen Morgan and Sharon Hodgson uh, and Callum Mahmood and Don Tuig in the Lords, if we're not the ones that are keeping an eye on the um, public sentiment, on the... Um, campaigning and communications and on the politics that underlie defence and security policy. Nobody else will. Brilliant. Well, I'm out of questions, but we've got quite a lot of readers' questions. I'm just going to put some of those to you now. There were quite a few on uh, the Overseas Operations Bill, sure. so I'll kind of merge some of them into a couple of questions. Um, obviously, Labour abstained on the at the second reading and then voted against the bill at the third reading um, uh, because you thought that there, there were great risks to you know our human rights and um, and lots of other very very serious issues in that in that bill and the government weren't willing to compromise. Uh, but because Labour went to abstain the first time, three front benchers had to had to stand down. And there were a few questions about how you felt about that. And um, 
them okay. having to stand down, you know, and obviously Labour then voted against the bill. Yeah, I'm I'm really sad we lost Beth Winter, Nadia Whittam and Olivia Blake. They're all newly elected. They're all really sort of talented, um, good centre-left Labour MPs for the future. But I recognise people have strongly held views on this. I took the view at second reading and about this bill, which led me to recommend and lead the party to abstain at that second reading um, as follows, really. First of all, there is a problem with vexatious legislation and repeat investigations that has arisen in particular following Iran and Af Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's arisen under successive governments, Labour and Conservatives. So there is a problem. Simply voting against the bill risked um, denying the problem. Secondly, I did not want us to walk into what is totally a Tory trap, which is a, a very crude attempt to continue the divisive um, culture war conflict, the sentiments, if you like, to restoke the sentiments that were there in the Brexit debate and vote. It is no coincidence that the Overseas Operations Bill was one of four commitments in the Conservative Manifesto to legislation in the first 100 days, and it was squeezed behind, between the uh, pledge to legislate for tougher penalties for terrorists, so they spend longer in jail, and to legislate for a tougher asylum system, an immigration system, based on points like uh, the Australians. So this was an attempt to continue the divisions and to paint Lab the Labour Party into a particular corner, and I was not going to have that. So what I've tried to do is to work with those concerned about this bill across the range, um, from the British League into Liberty, to work with military and legal experts, and to try and work to forge something of a consensus on the changes necessary to make this bill a better bill and do the job it needs to do. And what became clear over the first stages of the bill in the Commons was two things. Um, the first that this, the more, the, more you, the more people looked at this, the less they liked it. And the clearer it became that this is essentially a dishonest bill shouldn't surprise people that see this as simply a Tory political um, uh, gambit. Um, but it's a dishonest bill. It doesn't do what it says on the tin. It won't protect troops um, from repeat investigation. In fact, parts of this bill strip rights that um, troops have who serve overseas for, to bring claims against the MOD as their employer, rights that the rest of us in civilian life uh, have and enjoy. So it, it, it doesn't do what it should do. And secondly, um, we're confronted with ministers that are simply interested in the political fight um, and not in the policy. And they're in denial about the problems and flaws that are in this bill. So those were the circumstances and those were the reasons uh, that we voted then against at third reading. And in trying to deal with what is um, a very difficult territory for, for Labour, um, I and Keir Starmer wanted to hold the party together, which we had. And I wanted to try and, if you like, develop a new... And this is a this in a sense stands for our sort of bigger challenge. How do we develop a uh, a voice and a vision for the future, which both respects the deep attachment and long-standing adherence we have to international law, human rights, and those sort of values, with also being able to say that Labour is a party that speaks up for the frontline soldiers and troops. Labour is the party that can speak for the squaddy as well, if you like. And Labour is also the party that understands um, the, the, the forces families and forces communities that give so much to the sort of service of the country. And to some extent, we've got to find a way of bringing what are, um, have become, if you like, almost two separate 
sort of traditions and sets of interests back together again. And so dealing with the overseas operations bill is a, uh, a small focused first step on what I think over the next few years before the next election is our bigger task in this territory. Okay, another question. Um, this one's from Carol from Vauxhall. Uh, she says the UN treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons has received the requisite 50 ratifications and comes into force on 22nd of January. Another 84 countries have signed, but not yet ratified. Uh, it reflects a substantial shift in world opinion. Why is Labour silent on this treaty? Um, I think it's an important milestone um, in the, uh, I suppose, the context in which we need to see a fresh um, energy into multilateral um, disarmament and de-escalation talks. I think um, impossible when you had Donald Trump in the White House um, pulling the US out of um, arms control treaty after treaty, um, but something that potentially uh, may be possible now. And I'd like to see the British government um, much tougher uh, for some time in its arguments to the US administration that it must renew the START treaty uh, in the new year. It must extend that and it must get serious also about uh, other fronts that we need to deal with um, on the nuclear uh, disarmament on a multilateral basis. Thank you, I had a few uh, on that one. Um, Bernard said, referring back to your previous as well as your current job, do you have a plan to reduce the number of ex-servicemen and women who become homeless and particularly street homeless? Oh, we went into the election with a plan to end homelessness um, and end street homelessness, do that within five years. And we had um, that, uh, I was very proud of that. Um, it was something uh, I had the most uh, unfailing support from Jeremy Corbyn as leader. We shared that passion. Um, we did many meetings on uh, with homeless charities and homeless people together. Um, uh, in, in the end, I, I, want, I want to see Labour in government to end rough sleeping homelessness um, with veterans as part of that. And that would, be, that would be what I would most want to see. Uh, clearly, if I was Labour's Defence Secretary, I'd have a particular concern to make sure we put in place um, more immediate steps directed towards veterans. Um, but I'd want to play a part in a Labour government that did that over its first parliament. I think we saw a significant development during this crisis, didn't we, when they implemented a programme to end, you know, street homelessness and then <laughs> and then having proved that that was possible, said we can stop that now <laughs> and let things go back to normal. Yes. And the tragedy of this is we we know what needs to be done because we've done it before. Yeah. By, 20, by 2010, when we lost government, we'd all but ended street homelessness. And... Um, uh, it had taken ten years, but a serious program meant that we were in that we were in that position. Um, yeah, so we know what needs to be done, but we know we need a Labour government to do it. Uh, another question from Phil: Is a future Labour government likely to question the value of Trident? And he also asks, what role does he see? Does John see for the UK's two white elephant aircraft carriers? Uh, and what's his view on robotic weapons? I think you touched on that earlier. Yeah, well, we went into the last election. We went into the 2017, 2015, 2010 election with a commitment to maintain Trident. It's part of our duty, as I see it, as a P5 member. It's part of um, us being in a position to help influence, and I hope to help initiate the sort of multilateral de-escalation and disarmament that we want to see. Um, so that's that's settled Labour policy, as far as I'm concerned. It has been for some time. On the aircraft carriers, it's um, look we have them. Uh, we we have them, but part of the problem of recent years is that we haven't got British aircraft to fly off them. So we're having to borrow Japanese and American planes, uh, and that's part of the failing of the last ten years and the um, the failure to take the sort of procurement 
decisions that I talked about earlier on. Uh, there's no doubt about it. We are, you know, we're a maritime, we're, a, we're, we're an island nation. Uh, we need a navy. Um, what, we, what, of course, now we don't have, uh, having built those aircraft carriers, because the government has delayed some of the essential decisions about the next generation of uh, warships that are required as well, we have a gap in our British shipyards, uh, which for me makes it a no-brainer that they should say the support ships that are part and parcel of putting alongside our carriers uh, must be built in Britain. Uh, they've still not said that. Uh, they've tried to imply that's what's going to happen, but they've been delayed. Um, uh, they were first announced five years ago and they've still not let the contracts and they've still not given the commitment that these are ships that will be and should be built in Britain. And that, of course, would help protect the jobs. It would help keep the shipyards going and it would help maintain some of the skills that we need to keep in Britain and in our shipyards for future future uh, naval shipbuilding. Build it in Britain, as the plan said this morning. Build it in Britain. Um, so just a final question, Phil also asked, how big a problem will it be for us not having access to the EU Galileo military GPS signal? And just maybe if you could share some thoughts on what you think Brexit, you know, the end of the transition period is going to have on defence in the UK. Um, well, the, 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 the last question first. Uh, I don't know. It's not clear. There's been virtually no attention given to the security and defence arrangements that to, should continue on exit. Um, I think it's a it, it, it's a big loss not being part of that Galileo um, system. We were some of the we were one of the countries that led the way in setting it up. Um, we've led on some of the technology that has been central to its development so far. Um, the lesson I take from this is that we need to. Um, redouble our commitment to working with allies through NATO. Uh, the lesson I take from this is that the indications that um, the, the Tories' interests are going to swing more to the, uh, the, the Far East uh, and the uh, South China Seas does not make sense if we scale back or, or neglect the necessary commitment we have to make to NATO. And that is where our closest allies are. That's where our, um, some of our closest uh, threats are coming from. Um, and we um, downgrade um, or cool on our commitment to NATO, in my view, at our peril. Thank you so much, John. It's been really interesting. I think we've learned things. And we've covered a lot of ground in 55 minutes. So that was great. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you for everyone who's been watching on social media and on Labour List. Um, we're still doing these regularly um, and we'll keep doing them with front benches and shadow cabinet members. So stay tuned for more of these. Thank you very much.